They both tried to lighten their moods so that Christine wouldn't think anything was wrong and succeeded in fooling her. But every time they passed each other in the halls, the look they saw in the other's eyes caused their panic to grow. Ordinarily, a child was allowed to call their parents if they weren't feeling well or if they needed something from home. But they had no phone in the Cooper house and the neighbors would not allow them to receive calls at their house. So all they could do was wait for the end of the school day to reassure their minds that their mother was all right. Sitting in their last class of the day, Jay had to be reprimanded by the teacher at least five times to stop watching the clock and concentrate on his textbook. Miracle felt as if the clock had stopped and kept checking every three minutes to see if time was actually passing and felt like screaming when she saw only three minutes had gone by. Finally, it was three o'clock and they were back on the bus headed for home. They were the next to last children to be dropped off and they were relieved that they were going to be able to see their mother's smiling faces soon because then they could stop worrying and this feeling of gloom and doom would stop and all would be right with the world. As the bus turned onto Gates Avenue, the children began gathering their book bags together so they would be ready to get off as soon as they arrived in front of their door. They were so engrossed in their departing preparations that they did not notice the police cars and large crowd of people that were in front of their house. When the bus stopped and the children turned and spotted the scene that blocked the front of their small house, Miracle began to scream and Jay just dropped his books and began running towards his house. Michael Mead was the police officer that had been assigned to bring the Cooper children to the Department of Children's Services. He was a longtime friend of the children's father and thought his heart would break when he saw Desmond's boy running toward him with panic in his face and tears streaming from his eyes. Jay, hold on, slow down, wait a minute, he said, all the while trying to get between him and the house as the boy tried to barrel through him and get inside to see what had happened to his mother. Get out of my way, move, I wanna see my mother, he screamed as he began swinging at the officer. Hey, that kid's out of control. Get some handcuffs on him, shouted another officer as he witnessed Jay trying to get past his partner. Come on, Phil, he's upset is all. I've got him, he'll be okay, said Michael with a bit of an edge to his voice. His partner looked at him with disgust in his eyes. Michael was a little too soft-hearted for most of the white police officers in their little town and if it wasn't for the fact that he was married to the daughter of the mayor, he probably wouldn't even be on the force. But what everyone in this wretched little town didn't know, not even Michael's own wife, was that if he didn't love his family so much, he would leave this town. There was so much hate here that he was doing everything in his power to move his family as far away from it as possible. He had applied at several law enforcement agencies in various states and was at this moment waiting to see if any positions were available. When he received the firm offer, he would tell his wife and they would leave. That way he wouldn't have to deal with the constant haggling that he knew he would get from his fellow officers if they knew now what his intentions were. He remembered the day Desmond and Tracy were married and he was happy for his friend because he looked genuinely happy and totally in love with his beautiful bride. He was well aware of all the talk that was circulating around town about the mixed couple and his heart really went out for his friend. On the few occasions that Desmond talked to him about his problems, he advised him to take his family and move to a place that they could be happy and comfortable. But the mother-in-law from hell kept harassing her only son so much that he finally left his defenseless family and took up with another woman in the same town. Everyone in town was waiting for Tracy and the kids to slink away and finally rid them of this abominable blemish on their stellar reputation. But to everyone's surprise, she stayed. 
Michael was personally sorry to see them stay because he knew how mean people could be. And he especially felt bad for the kids. When he got the call that there was an automobile accident on Route 7 and there was a fatality, he was devastated to see that it was Tracy Cooper. When he saw her mangled body wrapped around the wreckage of her small car, his heart broke again for her three children and he couldn't stop the flow of tears that poured from his eyes. He sent a silent prayer to God to watch out for these kids because they were going to need it. He volunteered to be the one to bring the children into Children's Agency because he knew he was the only one that cared enough to be tactful and patient in a time when they had no one else. After he got the children to calm down, which wasn't an easy task, he drove them to the agency in his own personal car, not wanting to add any more discomfort to their situation than there already was. Listening to the smallest girl cry softly while her sister tried to comfort her almost broke his heart, but he knew tears were a healing bomb and that one day they would be okay. It was the boy that worried him the most. Jay had stopped crying and was staring blankly out of the window. This absence of emotion was a sign of possible shock, which could lead to a number of emotions, including depression, aggression, or even suicide. He would make sure there was a counselor available to address the children's needs before he left them. With all of the personal pain that was being experienced in the car at that moment, there was one shared emotion that each of the four people were feeling that the other three did not know about. There was one question going on inside of each of their heads. What was going to happen to them now? The funeral was a small gathering of Trace's children, Officer Michael, the children's school teacher, and the local minister, and it lasted all of 30 minutes from beginning to end. Although everyone in town knew about the service, no one was curious enough or kind-hearted enough to pay their respects to the Cooper family. Jay, Miracle, and Christine held hands through the entire service and stared straight ahead at the closed casket that contained their mother's body, which was too disfigured from the accident to have an open casket service. Michael's heart felt like it was about to burst every time he looked at the three motherless children and all he could do was give the girls a hug and shake hands with Jay in an attempt to make them feel someone was concerned about them. Since Desmond was too distraught and guilt-ridden to show his face at the funeral or to his children, he hadn't even shown up to show his respect. Miracle felt like God had abandoned them. First, he allowed their father to lead them and break their mother's heart. And now he allowed their mother to be killed, leaving them all alone in this whole world. She couldn't believe this was the same God their mother was always telling them they could trust to love and keep them when nobody else was around. What did you do when the God you trusted to keep your mother well so she could protect you let her die, knowing she was the only person in the whole wide world that loved you? Well, all Miracle knew was she was through trusting God and everybody else. From this moment on, she was going to do everything in her power to take care of herself and her little sister, Christine. Jay was not going to let anyone take care of him, and she wasn't sure she could do it anyway, so she wasn't even going to try. The look in Jay's eyes scared Mimi, and there was a distance in his attitude that told her he was never going to be the same again, so all she could do was wait and be there if he ever asked her for anything. The thought of them being separated was the greatest fear that they were facing at the moment. But with the way their life had turned out so far, it was almost inevitable that they were going to be torn from each other. She decided she was going to kick, scream, cry, 
and beg if necessary to keep her little sister close to her and hope it would do some good. Jay had given up hope of anything good ever happening to them again and just decided to never expect anything anymore. He refused to cry at the funeral, and when they lowered the casket into the ground, he turned away and walked back to the limousine without saying a word to anyone. Christine didn't realize the magnitude of what had happened to her mother, but the fact that her sister kept crying and her brother was acting so moody and sad made her know it was something really, really bad. When Mimi told her mommy had gone to heaven, she began to cry because mommy had told her that if someone went to heaven, it meant they were never going to come back again. The thought that she was never going to see her beautiful mother again, hear her laugh, be tickled by her, read with her, eat her cooking, smell her perfume, laugh at her corny jokes, cry at her scolding only to be comforted by her tender hugs made her feel sad beyond words. The only comfort she had was the gentle touch of her sister's hand as they sat with their fingers entwined and she held on to that hand for dear life.